Good evening everyone. My name is Jen Nolan and I'd like to welcome you to the third webinar in Arthritis and Osteoporosis Victoria's 2015 Musculoskeletal Health Webinar Series. Tonight's webinar is on the topic of fibromyalgia. Before introducing our presenter for tonight, I just have a couple of housekeeping issues. Firstly, if you have any technical, technical difficulties during the webinar, please refer to the chat box on your screen. You can type a message at any time that will be read by the webinar organiser at Redback Conferencing. If you are listening by the phone, you'll notice a small time delay between the audio and the screen. This is normal, so don't be concerned. Also, whilst our presenter will answer questions after the completion of his presentation, you can actually type questions for him at any time. Can I, su can I suggest you don't leave your questions to the last minute as we will aim to finish no later than 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I would also be very grateful if all participants could take a moment at the end of the webinar to complete the exit survey. It actually only takes you about 30 seconds to complete, so we would love you to do that. Our presenter for tonight is Dr. Geoffrey Littlejohn. Dr. Littlejohn is Professor of Medicine at Monash University, Director Emeritus of Rheumatology at Monash Health, and Adjunct Professor at Edith Cowan University in Perth. Dr. Littlejohn has published extensively on many aspects of fibromyalgia and has presented locally and internationally on the topic over many years. Without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to Jeff. Thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks, Jen, and thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk on fibromyalgia, which is a favourite topic of mine, as you probably realise. And it's a favourite topic because it's a very common problem and it's a very high impact problem. I have a few disclosures because I've been involved in many clinical trials and various issues to do with various drug companies, but that shouldn't interfere with the content of the talk. And I wish to talk about various aspects of fibromyalgia, just sort of an overview, if you like, uh, talking about some of the symptoms that people with fibromyalgia suffer from, the comorbidities that accompany fibromyalgia, some talk about the epidemiology and prevalence, the impact of the condition, and we'll talk a little bit about diagnosis, and there's been some changes in the area of diagnosis, and that's altered our um, approach to the fibromyalgia problem a little bit, which is to the good. Uh, talk about some of the mechanisms and management issues of fibromyalgia. And I like to use an elephant as the symbol of fibromyalgia. This is a little elephant from a Buddhist temple in just north of Chiang Mai, which um, struck my interest when I was there. So the first question is, what is fibromyalgia? And uh, it's still, in some people's eyes, a controversial um, syndrome or diagnosis, but I think uh, many people now are getting much more comfortable with fibromyalgia as a condition. It's a form of a chronic pain syndrome. In other words, pain is the key feature of the disorder, but there are characteristic clinical features which make up this syndromic presentation, and it tends to be a persisting problem, hence the chronic pain syndrome title. It has a very characteristic phenotype, though. Uh, the clinical picture is very characteristic and has key features which denote the condition, and these uh, features are widespread pain and widespread tenderness. They're the two sort of bottom line features of the condition. When people have widespread pain complaints, widespread tenderness, we're thinking in the area of fibromyalgia. But there are other characteristics of the disorder. Many people have a background uh, emotional distress or just feel out of sorts in the background. Uh, many people have a sleep disturbance. Many are fatigued and it's been recognised more recently, I think over the last 10 years or so, that cognitive, dis cognitive dysfunction, that's memory, poor memory, poor concentration, those sort of things, is also very common in this group of people. Many complain of muscular stiffness. So they're sort of the, the key features, if you like, widespread pain, widespread tenderness, but they come along with other common characteristics of sleep disturbance, fatigue, cog cognition problems, and emotional distress. Now, let's look at some of those symptoms in a survey. This is an on online survey of over 2,400 patients performed over in America. And they just asked people who uh, had, were diagnosed as having fibromyalgia, but there was no doctors involved in the survey. It's just a pure patient survey. Just asked the patients what symptoms they mainly suffered from. And this gives a good uh, sort of wrap-up of many of the symptoms. 
And if you start at the left here, muscular pain is basically present in all the patients, so that's like a core feature. But very high levels of fatigue and high levels of sleep disturbance follow that particular symptom. Many have pain in the joints rather than the muscles. And that's what we see in clinical practice. People can present with joint pain rather than muscle pain in many instances. Many have uh, headaches. I'm just making this a bit bigger so I can read it. Uh, many have restless legs. Up to 60% of patients with fibromyalgia will have restless legs. Uh, and interestingly, about half the patients will report numbness and tingling. So they have this, this um, pain and numbness sort of situation going on at the same time, which seems a bit weird. But we'll talk a bit, a bit about that later on in the, in the talk. So numbness and tingling, pins and needles, in a non-anatomical distribution is seen in the hands and feet. Impaired memory, as I mentioned, part of the cognition difficulties, cramping of muscles, impaired concentration, which goes with that cognition issue, nervousness, in other words, anxiety is quite a high feature in many people, and some are depressed. So in this particular survey, 20% of patients were depressed. It's an important point to make that Depression is not present in the majority of patients. Fibromyalgia is not an offshoot of depression, but depression can occur in the context of chronic pain. But the key things, 90% 90, 90 of patients have this fatigue, pain, sleep disturbance sort of grouping of symptoms. Now, the symptoms don't all occur at once, and they don't all occur to the same extent. So this is just a chart of one particular patient as an example of uh, someone with fibromyalgia. And I've listed here on the left the different symptoms they've got on a visual analog scale from 0 to, say, 100. And we've just sort of said, well, pain. They've got a lot of pain on this occasion that you see them. High levels of fatigue, muscle stiffness, sleep. But um, they don't, this, on that particular time, they don't have much in the way of dysesthesia, pins and needles, unpleasant sensory sensations in the periphery. Um, irritable bowel and bladder are present but not dominant. So the symptom severity will vary over time in individuals and between uh, patients. And this chart shows that again in five patients, we're looking over a year uh, and we are charting each particular patient's activity level, if you like, their total overall fibromyalgia activity on a score level up to 10. And we see different patterns. Uh, we see that the bottom patient has low level symptoms all the time, not much variation. This second patient has low level symptoms but flares up with increased symptoms of pain, fatigue for a few months and drops back to baseline. This, this patient here has mid-level symptoms all the time but flares up and goes up for a while and takes a while to settle down. Another patient has high levels most of the time. And this last patient has high levels with a flare which goes quite high for a short period of time. So these patients, the patients with fibromyalgia have variable uh, levels of symptoms over time, over the years, even over the months, over the weeks, over the days, and over the hours. And there have been surveys done in all of these sort of domains that show the, the fl fluctuation of symptoms in fibromyalgia. There's one survey that we were involved in many years back that showed people were worse in the mornings, worse late in the afternoon later in the day, but quite good for a window of about three to four hours in the mid part of the day where they did most of their activities and things they had to do. So there's a, there's a rhythm and a, and a variability to the symptoms in fibromyalgia. Well, what sort of symptoms are most people getting? We can group them, if you like, into two key symptom groups. The first symptom group are the central symptoms. And by central symptoms, I mean people have symptoms that are basically related to um, brain type function, brain spinal cord function like poor sleep, uh, fatigue levels, they get fuzziness in the head quite often and uh, we all know the phrase fibro fog where people just feel a bit foggy and can't quite um, f uh, focus easily. They have poor memory and concentration, often distressed as I've said and they may have mood disturbance. They also have amplification of symptoms. It's like a dial gets turned up in the body, so a lot of sensory input to the body gets amplified. And one of the key ones is pain, and that sort of denotes the, you know, why we call it fibromyalgia. But you may find other symptoms are amplified as well, such as the tingling and numbness. That can be quite prominent in some people and be the main dominant symptom. And those people might be seeing neurologists uh, for further advice or investigation. 
Some people get a lot of swelling uh, in the periphery or across joints in the hands and sometimes that swelling is hard, hard for us to appreciate but the patient recognises that swelling is occurring. The rings might tighten up dramatically and then they drop away, the swelling drops away again. And that can, be, that, that can be another set of symptoms that's amplified. Ringing in the ears is increased in patients with fibromyalgia. Bowel and bladder dysfunction, irritable bowel and bladder are also increased in fibromyalgia. But of course that can occur without the, the pain of fibromyalgia. Dryness of the eyes, and many people are investigated by the eye doctors or thought to have Sjogren's syndrome or something like that, um, where if their dryness of eyes and mouth is more severe than usual. Some people are, have amplified odours, so that uh, food or um, different odours really makes them feel off colour. And some get nausea with food and drugs. And this is a common thing we find. People with fibromyalgia are often quite intolerant to what we see as fairly low levels of medications at times. So two symptom sets, if you like, central symptoms and amplified sensations. The dial's turned up. And this is the old Hans Christian Andersen um, picture uh, of the story, the princess and the pea, where the princess uh, was tested out to see if she's a real princess by having 20 mattresses uh, to sleep on. And yet when the pea was put underneath the bottom mattress, she tossed and turned because she could feel there's something wrong with uh, the bed. Increased sensitivity, uh, obviously recognised in many areas. In fibromyalgia, I mentioned there's widespread pain and widespread tenderness. One of the first ways that people started to understand fibromyalgia was looking at the tenderness problem of fibromyalgia. And it turned out that's due to the fact that there's a widespread lowering of pain threshold in people with fibromyalgia. So the, the detection sen threshold to normal sensation is to, to um, sensory sensation is normal, so touch pressure is normal, people feel normal sensory um, findings, but the threshold to pain is lowered in fibromyalgia. So if you've got fibromyalgia, you'll get a pain sensation due to simple pressure, even just pressing with the thumb much more quickly than you would if you don't have fibromyalgia. And this relates to the general abnormality of central neurophysiological function in fibromyalgia. Another useful sign, apart from the widespread tenderness, is the presence of dermatographia. And in this particular patient, a 35-year-old lady who had fibromyalgia for about eight years, just simply scratching the skin or stroking the skin with the back of the fingernail very quickly gives a wheel and flare response. It's exaggerated compared to what you'd expect in a patient without fibromyalgia. Obviously, there's crossover between, between people without fibromyalgia and people with fibromyalgia. But we usually see this exaggerated flare response within about 10 seconds of doing this scratching on the back, very light scratching on the back. That's been found to be due to release of neurotransmitters from the C fibres in the periphery. The C fibres are part of the nociceptive system. And those C fibres are activated in fibromyalgia. And those particular fibre types release neurotransmitters such as substance P and calcitonin gene-related peptide which act to increase vasodilate, increase the blood flow to the area, and also act to uh, cause what they call neurogenic inflammation with release of fluid into the area, probably explaining a lot of the swelling people complain about. And to me, this is a useful sign because it's a visual link to the pain mechanism, and you can demonstrate that to the, to the patient. They can't, you can't see pain, but uh, you can't see tenderness. You can feel tenderness, but you can actually see this particular clinical sign in fibromyalgia. So how do we diagnose and classify fibromyalgia? And that for a long time was a difficult chore. But in 1990, uh, the American College of Rheumatology set out to try to work out the most common clinical features which uh, would be useful for uh, research into fibromyalgia. And they called these the ACR, American College of Rheumatology 1990 Fibromyalgia Classification Criteria. So they're not necessarily diagnostic criteria but they've been shown to be very useful for classifying the condition. And in fact, since these criteria came out, there's been over 7,000 papers on all aspects of fibromyalgia using these criteria to define the patients who are being studied in the, in the different um, um, trials and, and clinical studies. Now, these classification criteria linked widespread pain, which in these criteria had to be there for three months or more to eliminate intermittent viral infection or something else that might, might cause uh, widespread body pain. 
It had to involve all four quadrants of the body, so the upper and lower halves and both sides of the body. And the pain had to be accompanied by a wide range of tenderness through the body. They called, and they worked out that there are certain areas in the body that are a little bit more tender than other areas, even in normal people, and they, they're called tender points. Uh, in fibromyalgia, these spots are much more sensitive than normal, and uh, you can easily elicit the clinical sign of abnormal tenderness by palpating these areas uh, if you wish. And you can add these tender points up. They're in pre-designated pre areas. They've just been picked up by clinical uh, you know, examination over time. The actual areas are normal. They're just normal muscle or bone, muscle or um, fat or whatever in the area. But these areas are more sensitive and they're called tender points. So you have to link widespread pain and widespread tenderness by saying there's lots of these tender points around. So those criteria were very useful, but it was recognized that most people don't examine for tenderness and they don't do the so-called tender point count. And it was recognized uh, that there were uh, there was a need for better criteria to diagnose in the clinic, back in GP practice or in your in your rooms when you're seeing patients. And these were called the ACR 2010 criteria, diagnostic criteria, not classification. So these are used for diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And they were modified a bit in 2011. So there's sort of this 2010, 2011 diagnostic criteria. Now these criteria are interesting because they linked widespread pain, uh, which is reported by the patient. And they have a mannequin of 19 areas in the body and the patient ticks which areas are sore, like the shoulder girdles or upper arms, lower arms, right and left, hip, upper leg, lower leg, jaw, chest, abdomen, low back, etc. So these areas can be, are these areas sore in the last week before um, you do this survey? They mark that off and you get a score of up to 19. And then you ask the patients about the symptoms that we were discussing earlier, the key symptoms of fatigue, poor sleep, and cognition troubles. And they get rated from naught to three, naught being no trouble at all with fatigue, three being massively disabling fatigue that makes you uh, not able to function properly through the day. So it's sort of a, gra a clinical grading of these things, plus some key somatic symptoms that are common in fibromyalgia, headache, abdominal pain, which is the irritable bowel, and depression. They score one point. You add all these points up, and they worked out through statistical analysis that if you have a widespread pain index, which is this stuff on the left, of over or equal to over or seven, and a symptom severity score of over five, or if you have a lesser number of regions that are painful, plus a high symptom score severity, you can diagnose fibromyalgia if the score adds up to over 13. And it all seems a bit simplistic, but behind this is a heap of statistical analysis and hundreds and thousands of patients that were sort of analyzed to derive these clinical criteria. So the old criteria, the 1990 criteria, are still valid. And these criteria are still valid, but they're being used for slightly different things nowadays. And this is the one that's quite useful in the clinic. Um, and you might find it useful in your clinical practice. Now, interesting feature of this um, new criteria, if you have lesser amounts of pain, say three areas, say this patient has been in a motor car accident, and they're pain in the neck and pain in the shoulder girdle, maybe the chest wall three areas of pain, plus they're not sleeping, plus they're fatigued in a big way and they're not functioning cognitively, they can now fill, fulfill criteria of fibromyalgia. We used to call this regional pain syndrome, but now we find most regional pain syndromes can fit into the fibromyalgia construct, which I think it makes it a bit easier to, um, I think it's a good fit because the, the treatments uh, directed towards the regional pain syndrome are really the same as fibromyalgia, just a regionalized form of it, if you like. The 2010-11 uh, criteria also sort of brought to bear the mind-body implications in fibromyalgia. Poor sleep, cognition, fatigue, etc., seem to be more brain-mind orientated, whereas the pain is a bodily symptom. So this sort of construct that we have of mind-body medicine um, fits well with fibromyalgia. So just to summarize all of that, 1990, a little while ago, Widespread pain and widespread tenderness would give you the classification criteria for fibromyalgia. Over on the right, nowadays we're thinking widespread pain plus other characteristic symptoms gives you fibromyalgia. And in the clinic, in the, when we see a patient, like when I see a patient, I like to see all of those things present. I like to see widespread pain. I like to note that the patient is abnormally tender to gentle pressure through the body. And they do have these other characteristic symptoms. 
So in the contemporary clinical uh, world that we live in, they're the sort of criteria that I like to see in everyday practice. Now I mentioned that these, there's a, you can put all these into a little chart that the patient can, can fill out and um, you get the score. And when you add up this score, adding up the widespread pain and, and adding up the symptoms, you get a score which was called, it's been called many things, but in our practice now we call this the central sensitivity score. So the higher this score, the more that patient has abnormal central sensitization or sensitivity. The higher the score, the more they're prone to having a lot of other clinical features that link to central sensitivity. And I'll illustrate that in the next few slides. You can get this sort of thing off the net uh, or um, some of the articles we've written in recent years have this little chart which is useful in, in the clinic. So the benefits of the more recent criteria, we can get a score. And we recognize now that fibromyalgia is a spectrum condition. Like a lot of other conditions that we deal with, we deal with anxiety, depression, uh, a lot of other conditions uh, exist on a spectrum. Some people get a little bit of these things, some people get a lot. But it seems to be the same condition, just amplified up or amplified down. In fibromyalgia, higher scores increase the tendency to have central sensitivity. That means they have increased centrally driven pain. The pain mechanisms are centralized in these people. They're not, even though they get muscle pain or joint pain, it's not a condition that's abnormal in that area of pain complaint. The whole problem's centrally driven. And they also have increased in comorbid symptoms. They have increased dizziness and nausea uh, if uh, the higher this central sensitivity score is. And interestingly, the higher the score is, the less the patient will respond to opioids. So opioids aren't great drugs in people with high central sensitization. They can be great drugs in people with peripheral problems like low back pain, arthritis, etc., in certain circumstances, but they're not so good in the fibromyalgia context. And there's more psychosocial stress in the background of people with high sensitivity scores. So it's been quite a useful um, delineation of the characteristics of the problem, sort of giving us a different slant on fibromyalgia. We did a study at Monash looking at uh, patients with fibromyalgia. There's 146 patients a year or two back. And we looked at their central sensitivity score. We called it the fibromyalgia symptom score. It's the same score. As that score goes up, so do their tender point counts. So as the central sensitivity score goes up, so does the, uh, the generalized tenderness of the patient. So this score is picking up other characteristics of fibromyalgia. And this is an interesting use of this central sensitivity score in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. So this is 117 patients with rheumatoid arthritis. They don't have fibromyalgia. Um, but we looked at the same score in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. I don't know if you can read that, but the central sensitivity score is on the bottom axis. And as it gets higher, as the score gets higher, this is the patient's physical health score. This is the patient's mental health score. As the central sensitivity score goes up, their physical health score goes down dramatically and their mental health score goes down dramatically. So the sensitivity score is picking up these other or reflecting other characteristics of the health of that individual with rheumatoid, not with fibromyalgia. Um, so as I say, this is a spectrum disorder. We're, we're all on the spectrum, I guess, and some of us don't have much in the way of sensitivity, but some people do. And if you're in this spectrum, at the, at, if you're at the end of the spectrum, you'll have symptoms that derive from this particular aspect of the way your body's working and that may be misrepresented as being active rheumatoid rather than being due to the central sensitivity uh, mechanism that um, causes fibromyalgia. So we can apply this to any population. It's quite a useful little strategy. It's a spectrum and it reflects central sensitivity. Another paper came out just recently, a month or two back, um, and they looked at the central sensitivity score in patients having hip and knee arthroscopy, arthroplasty, so total hip or total knee uh, replacement. They measured the central sensitivity score before they had these procedures in 464 patients, preoperatively and also at six months. Patients with fibromyalgia were excluded, uh, but in the patients who are on the spectrum had higher levels of central sensitivity score, this independently predicted um, less improvement in pain over time. So people who start their operation with high scores get a worse outcome, have, have um, less pain improvement over time. 
So it just makes you wonder what we're treating sometimes when we do hip replacements and knee replacements in patients who have already got these high sensitivity scores. Now, fibromyalgia, in regard to diagnosis, um, it's not a diagnosis of exclusion. In other words, we don't have to do a thousand tests to exclude fibromyalgia and then say, I've looked at everything known to man, this is fibromyalgia. It is what it is. And the, if you fulfill the criteria for fibromyalgia, that's what you've got. You might have something else as well. You might have inflammatory bowel disease. You might have migraine headache problems. You, you might have menopausal symptoms. You might have a lot of other things. But if you fulfill the criteria for fibromyalgia, you've got fibromyalgia. Unless you're absolutely sure that the symptoms of the main condition can explain every single uh, part of the fibromyalgia uh, set of symptoms. So it's not a diagnosis of exclusion and it's not an exclusive diagnosis. It often um, is present in people with other illnesses, particularly chronic illnesses, uh, particularly chronic painful illnesses. So it's very common accompaniment of rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, osteoarthritis, low back pain, anything you think of that's got a bit of pain in it, you can get this centralized component which gives the fibromyalgia symptoms. And uh, other rotten diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, you name it, you'll find fibromyalgia in there and also chronic cancer patients. So you have to be aware that it's around and it's uh, not an exclusive diagnosis. Now there are some red flags. If we're thinking about patients with those sets of symptoms that I mentioned, uh, we have to make sure they don't have a primary condition such as inflammatory disease, we don't, they don't have a metabolic disorder such as a very low vitamin D or hypothyroidism or uh, hyperparathyroidism, other conditions that might cause widespread body pain. Make sure they haven't got a mechanical problem that might cause widespread pain such as malignancy, fractures, referred pain from the spine, etc. So we do need to do investigations at different times. And usually in, in a fibromyalgia workup, we'll do uh, inflammation markers, ESR, CRP. We'll do full blood examination. Uh, we we'll usually measure a muscle enzyme, anti-nuclear antibody, and some, maybe some rheumatoid serology if you think the patient's uh, got that sort of mix. You may also do routine biochemistry, thyroid function. I think you should always do because it often slips under the radar. And sometimes vitamin D, if it's very low, will cause similar symptoms. So we may also need some imaging. We just have to be selective about our testing, but there's usually a little bit of background testing we need before we're comfortable that this is the single diagnosis. Now the diagnosis is important in fibromyalgia. People used to say, oh look, I'm not gonna call this person having fibromyalgia because they, that will medicalize them, that will make them think they've got this weirdo condition and they'll fall in and, and sort of let that be, you know, make the most of it and, and not really try to get out of the condition that they're in. In fact, that's not the case. If This is a study from general practice in London, UK, 2,260 patients with fibromyalgia. That's these patients in the top. And these are matched controls that came to the same clinics. So the patients were diagnosed at this orange line in the middle. That's the date the fibromyalgia was diagnosed. Then they went back through the records retrospectively for 10 years and found that over the preceding 10 years, the patients had more and more tests were seeing more and more physical therapists, had more and more drugs, until eventually the diagnosis was made and then things dropped, whoops, dropped right back. So the diagnosis changed the behavior of the patient dramatically. It gave them a, a reason, they under, started to understand what the condition was, they didn't have to keep seeking the diagnosis. And that was in contrast to patients with other conditions who just kept on having the same sort of curve. So diagnosis is important, and in the majority of patients gives a positive impact on their clinical behavior. The epidemiology of fibromyalgia, if you look in the community uh, using surveys using the criteria that I've mentioned, you'll find that three to five percent of people fulfill the criteria that I've mentioned, um, which seems a lot and, and it is a lot. So a lot of people walking down the street that you, you pass in the street uh, will have fibromyalgia. And if you look in the mirror in the morning, you might find you're one of them. Who knows? <laughs> Three to five percent is a lot of people. So that's a big health issue. People presenting to a general practitioner, about 10% of patients going to general practitioners have fibromyalgia. About more if you go to a specialist, much more if you go to a rheumatologist because we're sort of filtering out people with chronic pain. But the same amount of people have fibromyalgia as, 
people with chronic illness have the same rate of fibromyalgia as those who are seeing, say, a specialist who sees a lot of musculoskeletal pain. In fact, if you've got a chronic illness, the rate is 10 times the community rate. This is 10 times the community rate if you've got a chronic illness. So you almost have to expect some symptoms of fibromyalgia in that group. If you look at the age, uh, this is some, a survey from Spain, and fibromyalgia occurs in children, more so in adolescent females. It occurs in elderly people for the first time. Uh, it can also occur through, mainly, mainly through the mid-years. So it's a bit of a U-shaped curve. So the 40s to 50s are a key uh, time for fibromyalgia. Most clinical trials on fibromyalgia, the mean age uh, is 51, and the patients had the condition for about 14 years. So they're pretty consistent. They say females to male is nine to one. That, that has changed a bit with the new criteria because males don't have as much general tenderness as females, just biologically. Females have uh, increased sensitivity to, to pressure and um, pain, you know, get pain more easily. So in the old criteria, used to be a lot more females to males, but when we use the widespread pain symptom criteria, we find that the female to male ratio goes right down to about five to one, and some people say it's even, even more, more even males to females, just that we present differently because of our biology. So fibromyalgia is the old elephant in the room. Um, this elephant saying I'm right there in the room and no one even acknowledges me. Um, and I think that's a good analogy. The old elephant in the room's uh, fibromyalgia. It's a lot of things, really. There's a high social societal impact of fibromyalgia in Australia. We do not have any specific data on fibromyalgia itself, but we know that chronic pain costs the Australian community $34 billion, billion dollars per annum. And about, if we look at the three to five percent of the population, about half a million to over one million people in Australia will have fibromyalgia. And that often translates into disability support pensions, workers' compensation, like persisting pain after injury that you'd expect it to settle, but it's not. Uh, people who can't work or people who do work but aren't working efficiently, the so-called presenteeism issues, fuzzy, fatigued, achy, can't concentrate, a lot of health costs, obviously a lot of family dysfunction will result in other societal consequences. So there's a heap of uh, outcome from fibromyalgia which is very negative. That's why we need to have it on our radar uh, more than we have. There are a lot of common comorbidities with fibromyalgia. These conditions, chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel, irritable bladder syndrome, regional pain syndromes like temporomandibular joint syndrome, restless legs, multiple chemical sensitivity type problems, um, dizziness, nausea, et cetera, et cetera. There's about a 30 to 40% overlap of those conditions with fibromyalgia, which is quite a high overlap. So obviously there's some common mechanisms involved there somewhere. So fibromyalgia associates with lots of disorders and our elephant gets too sensitive. So we have lots of different health specialists and people looking at different parts of the elephant saying, oh, this is what it is. It's a TMJ problem, oh, no, it's a joint problem or whatever it is. And the patient with fibromyalgia may see neurologists and gastros and ENTs and cardiologists and women's health specialists, physical therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists. A lot of different people see components of the problem. And I think if you stand back and see the elephant rather than just parts of it, sometimes that'll help um, work through the patient's problems. How does someone get fibromyalgia? Now, a lot of people start fibromyalgia with a stress, a trigger, a life stress. Sometimes it's just minor little bit by bit by bit stressors. Sometimes it's a more major uh, trigger like an accident or a work event or a family event, death or child gets on the ice or something like that. <laughs> Lots of different triggers in life, as you well know. And in some people, these triggers are very important in starting off the fibromyalgia process. It's been shown that um, there are different chemicals involved in the pain pathways that, such as serotonin and norepinephrine, noradrenaline, dopamine, which can have different polymorphisms in, in the genes that give different types of the um, monoamines or break them down in different ways, sort of alter the regulatory pathways of these monoamines that sometimes some people have less breakdown of, say, noradrenaline. And any, after any single stress, it'll stay in the body a lot longer and cause more symptoms than other people. So there are genetic factors that are operating in fibromyalgia. 
There's also psychological factors. So it's been shown that the psychological factors are particularly those that link in the, to the stress hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal axis and different characteristics, uh, some personalities, some how we behave, and particularly the three big C's, how we cope, are we in control, and do we catastrophize with different life events. These are big things that drive stress and seem to be overrepresented in fibromyalgia compared to other populations. So these things seem to help activate the process, um, and once activated, we then tend to get the, the societal and personal impact of the problem. So is it a genetic issue or an environmental issue? Um, it's been shown that fibromyalgia is increased in first degree relatives. So if a mother has fibromyalgia, the daughter has a high chance of having fibromyalgia, about 25%, likewise sister to sister. And the odds ratio of having fibromyalgia if a first degree relative has fibromyalgia is almost nine, 8.5. So eight to nine times as high of getting fibromyalgia if your mum's got it, uh, which is quite high, very high. But is that due to the fact that you're in an environment where maybe stress is causing a factor? Or is it the genes that you're inheriting that make you more prone to reacting to stress in that way? Don't really know yet. We know that fibromyalgia coaggregates co with major mood disorders in families with an odds ratio of almost two. So people who do have major depression have an increased rate of fibromyalgia and vice versa. But as I said earlier, it's not, not one thing causing the other. Twin studies show about a 50% risk, uh, risk of fibromyalgia is genetic and about 50% environmental. So that's, you can take your pick. But I think both things are operating. What about psychological factors? I've mentioned a few times that depression doesn't cause fibromyalgia. But in populations of patients with fibromyalgia, there's increased rates of depression and more so increased rates of anxiety and stress-related type symptoms. These symptoms are much more prevalent in patients who see health professionals rather than patients who manage their problems alone without seeking help from health professionals. So they've done these sort of studies that people are picked up as having fibromyalgia but they've never seen a doctor or a health professional about the problem. They have far less um, anxiety or depression than the ones that are going to see the health professional. So what's happening? What's going on? Please help me get me out of this situation. So the self-managers with fibromyalgia uh, have less psychological overlay, if you like. Many patients with fibromyalgia have distress in the background. Difficult life predicaments are common threads in fibromyalgia, as they are in so many other illnesses and conditions. The triggering stress in fibromyalgia may have apparently gone, but often if you delve into the situation a bit more, there are still issues that haven't been resolved. And that gets back to the Pandora's fibromyalgia box, the so-called yellow flags. When we see patients, we have to think of psychosocial and stress type factors as being uh, potential causes. And this is Pandora opening the box. And sometimes as health professionals, we're time poor and we don't open the box of asking the patient what could be behind all of these symptoms and is there some other issue happening? And we leave that box closed. And that means that the patient doesn't really uh, learn or understand what might be driving the symptoms. So there might be things in the box a family history of fibromyalgia, previous pain syndrome in the individual patient, some other medical condition they've got that's making them worried about where they're going to end up, lupus, rheumatoid, inflammatory bowel disease, etc. Stressors at home, at work, in the family, poor sleep habits, a newborn child not sleeping well, can't get that restoring sleep, starts to get um, more and more aching and pain. Work predicaments are very common associations with fibromyalgia. Injury to the spine is an association. Stress reactions, poor coping I've mentioned, and previous mood disorder or substance abuse. They're all sort of yellow flags, as you well know, that might uh, link to background psychosocial distress. Within the brain, we know that patients with fibromyalgia, if you give them a stimulus in the periphery, like a painful stimulus in the finger, they'll light up many, many areas in the brain as a response to that stimulus, many more areas than would occur in someone who didn't have fibromyalgia. So a wide range of um, flares, if you like, occur in the brains of patients with fibromyalgia under uh, a painful stimulus. So the brain is a bit 
amplified up itself, but also the part of the brain that controls pain, the so-called descending influences, also is overrepresented, and those areas aren't functioning as well either. <clears throat> and that seems to be the more important part. So in the brain, there's this so-called default mode network in fibromyalgia. Uh, it's a network that connects different parts of the brain, and this particular network links to emotion centers. And it's been shown that this center can predict abnormalities of this center in fibromyalgia to predict response to therapy and changes, and it does change with therapy. If you give treatment to increase glutamate in the brain, uh, this network will become functional again and the pain will improve. So there's been very elegant studies on the brain and networks in the brain that might be controlling some of these pain pathways in fibromyalgia. Also, there's a lot of studies on the link between the brain and the spinal cord and the key components are the pathways that link serotonin and noradrenaline. Those pathways that link the brain down to the spinal cord involving those chemicals are dysfunctional in fibromyalgia, many fibromyalgia patients. And that's where some of our drugs like amitriptyline and duloxetine symbolta target into that area. The opioid pathways, which also come from the brain down to the spinal cord, work normally in fibromyalgia. That probably work, indicates why opioids don't really work in these chronic pain states. I'll just hurry up a little bit so we have some time for discussion. The change in balance from the brain down to the spinal cord means that the uh, dorsal horn centers of the spinal cord, which is receiving all of this sensory information, become super sensitized. And we call that central sensitization. There's more activity within those pain neurons than there would be before. Um, lots of chemicals, particularly substance P and glutamate again, are released, making those chemicals more sensitive to inputs. And one of the inputs that influences pain in fibromyalgia are the so-called mechanoreceptors, the nerves coming from the muscle and the joints, which normally just tell you about movement uh, rather than pain, now gain access to the pain system because they interact with these sensitized dorsal horn neurons. So movement, joint activity, maintaining the same posture, etc., will now import into the sensitized spinal cord, causing pain. So it seems this is one of the key pathways, central sensitization due to change in pain control mechanisms from the brain. I'll just very briefly say that in recent years, people have been doing skin biopsies in fibromyalgia, finding that some of the small fibers in the um, body are not working as well. They're reduced in numbers and um, they are abnormal uh, anatomically. And this might be a clue to something happening in the nervous system within the periphery, within um, the, the areas of symptoms. This is probably, uh, this is just a, a picture which I won't explain that proves that this is true, uh, but this is probably uh, due to the neuropeptides that are released from the activated C fibers in patients with fibromyalgia, probably damaging regional nerves. Whether that causes symptoms or not is unclear, but this is an area of great interest. Uh, so we're getting interesting findings in the brain networks, interesting findings in the spinal cord, and now interesting findings back in the periphery, and maybe uh, this might help understand fibromyalgia more over time. So where does the pain in fibromyalgia start from? We've got a system that's amplified and ramped up. It's sensitized. And there's po possibly pain generators within the, the joints of the body, perhaps someone with arthritis, maybe people with tight muscles and unfit people will, with trigger points. And these sensitized muscle areas will put input into the spinal cord, which gets amplified and causes more pain maybe poor posture in the neck and back, and maybe this um, neuroinflammation that I was mentioning in these nerves, maybe that's generating pain. Still don't quite know, but um, I think if you look at all of these things, the main problem is this amplification problem, and these are contributors, but this is the key issue. So pathway start off with, I've mentioned a lot of psychological distress can be present. There's mechanisms in the brain that activate brain responses. Spinal cord gets sensitized, and we get clinical features. How do we manage fibromyalgia? We have to have a broad uh, approach. We have to completely evaluate the patient with appropriate investigations, as I've mentioned, examination, etc. rule out red flags. We have to look at the key domains, which component of fibromyalgia is driving that patient's symptoms. Is it sleep, fatigue, pain, restless legs, tingling, numbness, whatever. We have to sort of try to focus on the main thing if we can. We look for comorbid conditions and we 
uh, start our plan, which is our basic management plan, which is education. The more people know about what the condition is, what's causing it, the ins and outs of it, the better they can understand and uh, self-manage themselves. Exercise is a key component of fibromyalgia management. Low impact aerobic exercise has been shown to do as much as many of these high, you know, high powered drugs that are coming through. Psychological strategies are extraordinarily important as well. They have a very high effect size in causing good relief of symptoms if the patient can understand what you're getting at there. Sometimes they don't like to address the issues immediately. And we've got drugs. And of course, doctors like prescribing drugs. Some of the drugs that we've got in fibromyalgia are ones that modulate different targets in the fibromyalgia cascade. So we might modulate distress or sleep or central nervous system glutamate levels, the descending dorsal horn modulation area, dorsal horn sensitivity, uh, cannabinoids, medical marijuana, that sort of thing is very um, a target, dopamine target, serotonin, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of areas that have potential ways of modulating this cascade of events. And sometimes you target one area and that's enough for that patient to downregulate the whole problem. We tend to use low dose tricyclic medications very commonly uh, in the mid evening to help sleep and help um, uh, morning symptoms. Sometimes not that well tolerated. We use gabapentinoids, which is pregabalin and gabapentin. Uh, these drugs are not on the PBS for these conditions, but they are approved in other countries for fibromyalgia. There's new drugs coming through like memantine, which can target one of the receptors in the dorsal horn, which looks very promising. Um, selective nor nor, sorry, serotonin noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, are the best drugs in fibromyalgia if you're trying to modulate that descending pathway. That's duloxetine, um, which is called Cymbalta, or milnasopran, which is called Joncia, and that drug's going to be released in Australia hopefully later this year. Other drugs that could be used are tramadol and tapentadol. So I don't want to go into all of that, but just, just mention some of them. Non-proven therapies, steroids don't work, magnesium doesn't work, guaracetic acid doesn't work, muscle relaxants and hypnotics need to be used with caution. So do people get better? The majority do seem to improve. It's a spectrum disorder. I think about 80% of people have variable symptoms and the potential to improve quite a lot. I think about 20% of people have quite a fixed uh, problem and are much harder to deal with. And they often need the multidisciplinary approach, sometimes pain clinic approaches. Uh, if you look at trials of just one drug in patients, you, you find that 30% of people get 50% improvement, which is very dramatic. But, and 50% get 30% improvement with trial drugs, which is not bad. But that means 50% don't get any improvement. So the drugs help some, but not all. And they always have to be used in conjunction with other treatment plans. <clears throat> I might just jump over that one. So I've really said management issues. We've got to treat the mechanism if we can, identify which patient out, uh, subgroups will respond best, and recognize there's a large psychosocial input and avoid medicalizing the problem. So just to finish off, fibromyalgia is an important elephant in many rooms. It um, has a very characteristic clinical phenotype, set of symptoms and signs. It's common, as I said. It has a very high impact. I didn't mention about the way people measure impact with um, functional sort of approaches, but the impact of fibromyalgia is greater than chronic heart failure, renal failure, or uh, renal dialysis patients. Central mechanisms are very important. We're in a phase of evolving management strategies, and overall it's an important problem. So I'll just finish there, Jen, and um, I'll turn to questions as they might come. Fantastic, Jeff. A very, very comprehensive and interesting presentation. We have got some questions that have come through. Um, and we've got a fairly, we've got 10 minutes and we might be able to get through most of them. If there's any questions that we don't manage to answer, I might get you to answer them offline and we'll provide those responses to participants later on. I think some of the questions you have actually answered in the course of the presentation. Uh, an interesting question that's come through is that um, a person que is querying that uh, they, they had read that fibromyalgia is a Western disease. Is there any research about this or answers as to why? Western, west of what? <laughs> I think. <laughs> is it, is it, I guess is it more prevalent in certain parts of the world or in, in, in Western societies more than others? 
Well, I, I guess the surveys of fibromyalgia have basically been done in countries that do clinical research, which are largely, in inverted commas, Western countries. But all surveys in all countries that have performed, been performed from um, you know, the Scandinavian countries through to Turkey, America, England, uh, anywhere you look, you get the same rates of fibromyalgia. There was one study from um, South Africa which showed a slight difference between people in the country areas of, fibro of South Africa having less frequent fibromyalgia than people in city areas. There was, a, there was a survey in Israel looking at a town that was right next to the border of um, um, Lebanon and in, prone to being bombed compared to a similar, very similar community about 50 kilometres further inland showing much higher levels of fibromyalgia in the potential bombing, one, bombing area. So there's, lot, there's been lots of that sort of stuff looked at, but everywhere you look, it's pretty similar. Mm -hmm. It's a human condition, I think, a human response. And I think a lot of it's to stress. If there's no stress, you probably don't find as much fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. Another question, um, and I think you uh, responded to this when you're talking about the central sensitivity, but is polymyalgia rheumatica on the same spectrum as fibromyalgia? No, we would say polymyalgia, polymyalgia rheumatica is an inflammatory condition. And um, more recently, studies have shown inflammation on PET scans in, in polymyalgia rheumatica in joints. So polymyalgia rheumatica has very high levels of uh, ESR and CRP, the ind indices of inflammation. So it's a different condition altogether, although it can, you can have mimicking symptoms. So that's one of the ones you have to totally rule out. But you can do that easily with the blood test, ESR or CRP. And that's usually elderly people over 50, well, midlife people over 50, but fibromyalgia may be across all ages. Okay, what is your distinction between central sensitivity and fibromyalgia? Uh, I think central sensitivity or central sensitization is a mechanism with people with fibromyalgia, which, which is a mechanism that causes many symptoms in people with fibromyalgia. So um, we tend to use the term central sensitivity just because patients to, seem to understand that a little bit more. Sensitivity people understand. Like if you get a, a bee sting, the area is quite sensitive for a few days afterwards. You know, thresholds change and each things change. Sensitivity people understand, so we tend to use central sensitivity. But in my in my brain, I think central sensitization is the process behind that, and that occurs in the nervous system in many different conditions and situations, and including the pain system. Is is there, is there a link to ser serotonin level? Um, serotonin levels per se. There's been lots of studies on serotonin in fibromyalgia. People have, uh, do have lower serotonin in fibromyalgia, but it, <clears throat> it's difficult to measure it specifically, but it is one of the neurochemicals that's altered in fibromyalgia uh, in the spinal cord and also in, in, the, in the blood, but it's measured in a, in a different way in the blood than the spinal cord. Yep, there is an abnormality in serotonin, as there is in substance P. Substance P is one of those neurochemicals I mentioned. That's about four times as high in the spinal fluid in fibromyalgia patients compared to people without fibromyalgia. So there are a number of things that you can measure, but they're not routine tests that we can measure in everyday activity. And what are your thoughts on gene therapy to switch off the fibromyalgia mechanism? Um, someone, the, the person who posed this question had heard of some research on, on gene doping. Uh, I haven't heard of that, but obviously if you can identify a gene that's abnormal, and you have a mechanism to switch it off, you would certainly consider that option. But I haven't heard of that yet, but it sounds like perhaps the future. I don't know. <laughs> um, and can you sort of comment, can you sort of generalise with regards to what type of personalities are represented in the, um, in the population of people who, who have fibromyalgia? Um, it's a difficult one. Um, Katrina Malin is a psychologist doing a PhD in this area and did a survey of about 100 people with fibromyalgia and looked for personality subtypes. And one personality subtype that came out in younger women was so-called neuroticism, which is not to say people are neurotic and wacko, it's just, it's just the way people handle stress. Uh, and they handle stress quite differently and not as well as other people. And that sort of personality, I think, comes through as being um, something that so people who generate stress in their life, who worry a lot, ruminate a lot, and make you know, catastrophize and small things become bigger, um, are the sort of personalities that tend to have fibromyalgia associations. It used to be thought maybe type A and all those sort of things, but 
It's more personalities or psychological uh, styles that generate stress that seem to be the link in fibromyalgia. Not always, but it's, it's an association. You mentioned exercise as part of the management plan. There's a question just asking specifically about um, activities like yoga and Tai Chi and, and whether they would be from the point of view of a stress reliever or are they sort of more in a, a physical sense, the role of exercise in the management? Yes, probably both. I mean, both those um, strategies, I think the so-called mind-body strategies, yoga, Tai Chi and Pilates and different things like that, I think are, are fantastic for fibromyalgia. Um, in regard to exercise itself, we recommend low impact aerobic exercise of any type. There's been no study that's shown one type of exercise to be better than another as long as you are exercising. So it's, it's the usual message about exercise and general health, but it's a very potent uh, benefit in fibromyalgia. You have to make sure the patient can exercise and uh, you know, because of their pain and fatigue it's often quite difficult so you have to do it very slowly. We usually say it takes three times as long to get fit if you've got fibromyalgia than if you haven't got fibromyalgia. So general exercise of any type but also those specific types, I think they have a lot of mind uh, impact on the fibromyalgia as much as the body impact. Cheap, easy to do. And probably time for one last question. Um, what about the role of work employment as part of the treatment plan? Do you have a specific focus on that? I with regards to, I suppose, depending on the client. Yeah, I mean, I, I, did, I did skip over a slide which looked at some of the things that happened after injury in society. Uh, I think one of the key things in management of someone with a fibromyalgia in the context of work is to try to keep them at work. I think having something to do in life is extremely important. It empowers a person. It helps money issues. It makes them feel much better about themselves. Uh, I think. Keeping people at work is a high priority in fibromyalgia management and a lot of people think, oh, it's time to give up, I just can't do it anymore, will you sign my certificate, you know, and become disabled now. You know, not a good thing, keep people at work. But you might have to modify work and accommodate work for them. Okay, Jeff, I think that does it for the questions. On behalf of everyone, can I thank you very much for a most interesting um, presentation on a really such an important topic. And as you sort of say, it, it is very much the elephant in the room. Um, I'd like to thank you for giving of your time this evening. I'd like to thank all the uh, people who participated and um, encourage you to join our next webinar, which will be in June on back pain and I also ask you now to take a moment to complete the exit survey and on that night I wish you all a good night. Thank you.